saying no thanks to McCarthy, who has been in the House for 16 years, and they want somebody else, anybody else, and they're not budging. And at this point, it's not about negotiation. There's really very little Kevin McCarthy could do to get any more support from the hardliners. He's already conceded on the motion to vacate the procedural rule to start getting the speaker out of that job, moving that threshold down to just one member. He's already conceded in terms of the Rules Committee, putting more House Freedom Caucus members on that committee. So the cupboard is bare in terms of what he can offer these people on the floor. And that's why you see McCarthy, as you watch these proceedings, somewhat at ease, in, at least in his personal bearing, knowing that there's very little he can do but just hope that there's an erosion of this stand down, an erosion of support for this standoff among these House Freedom Caucus members. But for now, everybody's milling around the House floor, speakerless, and really confused about what's going to happen on a second ballot because no one's emerging right now as a consensus candidate. Steve Scalise, the number two, isn't raising his hand saying, hey, it's time for Kevin to step away. That's not happening. The idea of Tom Emmer, the majority whip, or Fred Upton, the outgoing Michigan Republican, stepping in, that's not happening. So, so many dynamics at play right now as we watch a very messy scene. Let's remind people of the math on what exactly transpired earlier. Kevin McCarthy got 203 votes from his fellow Republicans. Hakeem Jeffries, the Brooklyn congressman set to be Democratic leader, got 212. Neither gentleman got the 218 needed with 434 members of the House voting. 19 Republicans voted for someone other than Kevin McCarthy. Andy Biggs of Arizona, who had mounted the most formal and vocal campaign against McCarthy, was formally nominated on the floor. He got 10 votes. Jim Jordan of Ohio, the scrappy, presumed incoming House Judiciary Committee chairman, a former wrestling coach, got six votes. Jim Banks, a leader of the Republican Study Committee, a conservative block of House Republicans, got one vote. Former Congressman Lee Zeldin of New York got one. And Congressman Byron Donalds of South Florida got one as well. That, as Bob said, leads to the chaos and unprecedented situation that we're in and the stare down, in essence, that we are trying to sort out. You see there Elise Stefanik on the left, who's set to be the conference chairwoman, Jim Jordan there in the yellow tie on the right, who is the presumed Judiciary Committee chairman. That's Marjorie Taylor Greene, the infamous Georgia congresswoman uh, who has emerged as a supporter of Kevin McCarthy, who she appears to be talking to. Bob, remind us, who are these anti-Kevin, never-Kevin congressmen and women? What parts of the country are they from? And, and beyond the sort of organizational things they're trying to extract, why, why do this? What's the political upside for them? Well, if you just look at this scene right now, you see Jim Jordan from Ohio. As you said, Ed, the incoming Judiciary Committee chairman, it says so much that he is with McCarthy. So many of the hardliners from the House Freedom Caucus love Jim Jordan, see him as a real Trump ally. They would love to see Jim Jordan emerge as a consensus pick. But he remains there with McCarthy, sitting there right next to McCarthy. Actions speak, especially in crisis moments like this. Elise Stefanik, a favorite of former President Trump, sitting right next to Jordan. Marjorie Taylor Greene kicked off committees but has the support of Kevin McCarthy. She's been urging her conservative allies uh, on the right in the House to stand with McCarthy. And so for now, after this first ballot, you see them congregating around the California Congressman Kevin McCarthy, the Bakersfield native, saying, hey, just by being physically near him, that they're still with him politically. And what you see is a, a really disparate a group of the uh, opponents to McCarthy. There's no real through line other than they have personal or political grievances with McCarthy. Someone like Matt Gates of Florida just doesn't like McCarthy, uh, really f finds him unseemly as a political leader, and he, he just flatly says he's a no, he's not going to budge. Uh, it, mostly red districts. This is not the problem solvers caucus revolting against Kevin McCarthy. These are hardline conservative members. Uh, but not necessarily the most high-profile ones like Marjorie Taylor Greene. These are more uh, of really fiscally conservative types like Chip Roy of Texas, a former chief of staff, uh, to Ted Cruz, the U.S. senator. It's people who come from that harder right, anti-establishment wing, not necessarily the most high-profile people, but those who grumble about McCarthy being too close, in their view, to lobbyists, to K Street, to business, to the business community.
You're watching live CBS News coverage of what we can only describe as some version of chaos on the floor of the House of Representatives as we wait to see who will be the next speaker. I'm Ed O'Keefe along with Caitlin Huey Burns, Robert Costa, Nicole Killian, our colleague Scott McFarland as well, who's been in the chamber, says he just spoke with uh, Congressman Bob Good of Virginia, who says the block of Republican members who opposed McCarthy on the first speaker vote, quote, will never back down. He says they want a reluctant warrior to emerge as speaker. Congressman Good predicts that Jim Jordan, who we just saw a moment ago in that yellow tie, will gain votes on the second ballot whenever it's held. And Congressman Good says McCarthy should pull out of the race. And it's worth noting, too, that Jim Jordan has said that he does not want to be speaker. Right. He wants to be the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and that would uh, be a powerful position. And you saw him sitting with McCarthy just there on the House floor, um, maintaining this kind of, you know, uh, support of him. Um, so you essentially, as we were describing it, a game of chicken between uh, Cong uh, Congressman McCarthy and these lawmakers who are trying to extract some concessions from for, from him, weaken him, or uh, to that note from Scott, um, get someone else. Um, we're going to go now to Nicole Killian, who is outside that House chamber. Um, Nicole, kind of give us a sense of, of what you are seeing. Are members coming out and coming in? Uh, what are they saying uh, about how they're feeling about this moment in time where we are, in Bob's words, speakerless? Yeah, I was going to say it almost feels like intermission <laughs> at a performance, and not to say that what's happening on the floor is a performance, but, you know, as you know, with big days like this, you know, many of these members and incoming lawmakers bring their families, so there are kids standing in the hallway licking ice cream, <laughs> you know, there are just people <laughs> milling about the hallways, kind of like wondering what, what to do next, and of course, there are some members uh, in the halls as well. Uh, we did see a Leader McCarthy exit uh, the floor. Uh, it doesn't appear that he has gone back to the speaker suite, which is actually where he has set up shop, even though he doesn't have the job officially right now. And of course, that's right down the hallway from where we're standing. Speaker Nancy Pelosi's nameplate has been removed, of course, now that she is returning as a rank and file member. And so that office is literally uh, kind of standing almost empty, if you will, without any kind of signage. Uh, but for uh, McCarthy and some of his staffers who have started uh, to move in. Uh, that being said, you know, I think we are in a bit of flux and uncertainty as to what may happen next. You know, I think, generally speaking, we were expecting that this would move into a second round of voting, but now that some members have exited the floor, it's unclear if that will be the next step, whether there will be some kind of motion to adjourn where, especially on the Republican side, uh, you know, Republicans might have a chance to convene behind closed doors uh, to try to sort things out further. Uh, it's just very unclear what those next steps may be. But generally speaking, uh, that is the process. If, uh, you know, the speaker does not win that first ballot, and then we expect this to go into multiple ballots. It could go to a second ballot, a third ballot, a fourth ballot. And you talk to members, they, too, don't necessarily know how this is going to play out, how many ballots there could be, how long we could be here today, whether this will stretch until tomorrow. I've gotten so many <laughs> different answers answers from so many different people, and the short answer is we simply don't know. We see some of those children milling about just behind you there, and this again is Cheryl Johnson, the clerk of the House, who right now, in essence, is in charge of the House of Representatives. This is a appointed position by the former speaker, Nancy Pelosi. She's still in the job because there's no new speaker to hire a new clerk, but Cheryl Johnson is essentially... Uh, the conductor of this band, and she's going to tell us what the next step is at some point here. We're still waiting for her to speak out and explain when a second round of balloting might begin. Robert Costa, are you still with us? Okay, we'll get back to Robert Costa in a little bit. But Bob was making a great point earlier, too, um, about kind of what this coalition of anti-McCarthy uh, lawmakers looks like. And, and it's not accurate to describe it as, you know, one certain type of lawmaker. It's not as if this is part of, you know, the, the MAGA wing or the right. Trump wing of the Republican Party. Um, it's here we go, here we go. Noting
previous speaker. She is, in essence, uh, in charge of this meeting until a speaker is elected. And she's trying, obviously, to get order in the House so that we can continue. The House will be in order. The tellers agree in their tallies that the total number of votes cast is 434, of which the Honorable Hakeem Jeffries of the State of New York has received 212. Kevin McCarthy of the state of California has received 203. The Honorable Andy Biggs of the state of Arizona has received 10. Honorable Jim Jordan of the state of Ohio has received six. The Honorable Jim Banks of the state of Indiana has received one. The Honorable Lee Zeldin of the state of New York has received one. The Honorable Byron Donalds of the state of Florida has received one. No persons, having received a majority of the whole number of votes cast by surname, a speaker has not been elected. Following the procedure used by the House in 1923 and recorded in Canon's Precedent, Volume 6, Section 24, the clerk is prepared to direct the reading clerk to call a roll anew. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? I rise to nominate Kevin McCarthy for Speaker of the House. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, I think we have three objectives this Congress, three fundamental things we have to get done in the 118th Congress. First, pass the bills that fix the problems. In two years' time, we have, went, we, we have a border that is no longer a border. We have a military that can't meet its recruitment goals. We have bad energy policy, bad education policy, record spending, record inflation, record debt, and a government that has been weaponized against we the people, against the very people we represent. So we, we need to pass legislation to address all that. And I hope my Democrat colleagues will join me. I really do. But I have my doubts. And if they don't, and if Chuck Schumer says, no, we're not going to take up that legislation that we pass, and if Joe Biden won't sign it, so be it. They'll have to, they'll have to answer to the people in 2024. Second, second, we can never, ever let a bill like the one that passed 12 days ago, $1.7 trillion spent, we can never, ever let that kind of legislation pass again. We, We have, 
to, we have to pass a budget that makes sense, that's good common sense, then do the 12 appropriation bills that, that, are, that recognize it's the people's money, not ours, and send it to the Senate, and then stand firm on that legislation. And again, if they won't take it up, and Joe Biden won't sign it, we can stand firm on a CR or something. We can have that fight, but we are not going to have what took place a week and a half ago ever happen again. And then finally, third, and this is important, we got to do the oversight, well, the do House the investigations. We have to do the oversight and the investigations that need to be done. This idea that bureaucrats who never put their name on a ballot but think they run the country, who have assaulted our constituents' First Amendment liberties, they need to be held accountable. That has to happen. We need to do it. We need to do it in a way that's consistent with the Constitution, but we need to do it vigorously and aggressively. That is part of our duty as members of this body. To my friends here on this side of the aisle, I would just say this. The differences we may have, the differences between Joyce and Jordan or Biggs and Bacon, they pale in comparison to the differences between us and the left, which now unfortunately controls the other party. So we had better... We had better come together and fight for these key things, these three things. That's, that's what the people want us to do. And I think Kevin McCarthy is the right guy to lead us. I really do, or I wouldn't be standing up here giving this speech. I, I came in with Kevin. We came in the same time 16 years ago. We haven't always agreed on everything, but I like his fight. I like his tenacity, and I like it. I remember Kevin told me, I actually wrote about this in a book. I remember Kevin told me, he said, when the, the toughest times in life are when you get knocked down. The question is, can you come back? And I've always seen him be able to do that. We need to rally around him, come together, and deal with these three things, because this is what the people sent us here to do. My favorite scripture verse is 2 Timothy 4, 7. Paul's the old guy giving advice to the young guy, and he says, fight the good fight, finish the course, keep the faith. I like the verse because it's a verse of action. Fight, finish, keep, not wimpy words, words that I think fit America. That's what the American people want us to do. They want us to fight for the things they care about and they elected us to do. And we should all remember, we should all remember, only about 12,000 people have ever had the opportunity to do what we're doing today, sit in this body, serve in this Congress. It is a privilege. It is an opportunity. We owe it to them, the American people, the good people of this great country, to step forward, to come together Get a speaker elected so we can address these three things. I hope you'll vote for Kevin McCarthy, and that's why I'm proud to nominate him for Speaker of the House. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Thank you, Madam Clerk. We're witnessing history here today. I wasn't, for half of that, I wasn't quite sure who the gentleman from Ohio was nominating. He was nominating himself. And Is the gentleman rising to place a name and nomination? I am. I, I am, Madam Clerk. I am. I'd just like to be afforded the, the same opportunity that the gentleman from Ohio took, Madam Clerk. Consider, consider all that's happened. The last time an election for speaker went to a second ballot, Leader Jeffrey's beloved New York Yankees had not yet won a World Series. Consider all that's happened since then. The work that the body has entertained, the work that we've done for the people over that time. We are unified behind a speaker who will continue that progress despite the chaos on the other side, Madam Clerk. We are gonna stay here to get this done. We are unified and we are all gonna support Hakeem Jeffries for speaker. The lead vote getter, the lead vote getter in the last ballot. Right. Madam Clerk is chair of the Democratic Caucus. I'm directed by the vote of the caucus to present for election to the office of Speaker of the House of Representatives for the 118th Congress, the name of the Honorable Hakeem Jeffries, the representative elect, for the state of New York once again, and we will be unified once again in our support for him.
For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida rise? To nominate a candidate for Speaker of the House. The gentleman is recognized. Well, sometimes we have to do jobs that we don't really want to do. And sometimes we have to do jobs that we are called to do. And so, my colleagues, I rise to nominate the most talented, hardest working member of the Republican conference who just gave a speech with more vision than we have ever heard from the alternative. I'm nominating Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan is humble, perhaps today humble to a fault, maybe the right person for the job of Speaker of the House isn't someone who wants it so bad. Maybe the right person for the job of Speaker of the House isn't someone who has sold shares of themselves for more than a decade to get it. Maybe Jim Jordan is the right person for Speaker of the House because he is not beholden to the lobbyists and special interests who have corrupted this place and corrupted this nation under the leadership of both Republicans and Democrats. Maybe Jim Jordan would be the right person for Speaker of the House because he wouldn't fight us when we try to get a term limits bill on the floor. Maybe Jim Jordan would be the right person because he wouldn't fight us when we try to put a balanced budget on the floor and vote for it. And maybe Jim Jordan is the right person because he would endorse the plan that was built by the Texas delegation to finally secure our border. Mr. Jordan said in his nomination that there are certain bills that we have to pass to fix the problem. The challenge is the alternative has been someone voting for the very bills that have caused these problems. Mr. Jordan says that we cannot accept legislation like the omnibus, and I fully agree. And if Jim Jordan were Speaker of the House, if he were the leader of the Republican team, we wouldn't have that circumstance choking the economy of our country, increasing inflation, and diminishing the prospects of a better life for our fellow Americans. And finally, Mr. Jordan said we must engage in rigorous oversight. Every one of my Republican colleagues knows that the person who can lead that oversight effort, who works on it every day, who has the skill and the talent and the will, is Jim Jordan. I'm nominating him, and I'm voting for him. The reading clerk will call the roll. So here we go again. You are watching live coverage of the floor of the House where they are about to begin a second round of voting for speaker as Kevin McCarthy fell short in the first round, unable to clinch the 218 votes needed to win the gavel. And for now, the House remains in control of the hired staff of the clerk's office who will conduct this next vote again alphabetically they will go through all 434 members in the chamber and this could take about another hour or so we'll see and as this plays out let's talk to our colleague scott mcfarland who had watched the first round from the rafters or the house gallery as we call it scott you were there for the first one and you also had hinted as we reported a short while ago that we might in this second round see this block of never mccarthy Republicans coalesce behind Jim Jordan. Talk to us about yeah. that and what you've yeah, seen Bob so far. Good. The congressman from Charlottesville, Virginia, told me they are going to try to move these non-McCarthy votes in the House Republican Conference toward Jim Jordan. And Congressman Good thinks that they will be able to galvanize at least some of those nearly 20 votes to go toward Jordan. Perhaps a trajectory of momentum if there's a third or a fourth ballot. And you heard Matt Gates allude to that as well saying the speech Jim Jordan just gave sounded more like the speech of a Republican House Speaker than Kevin McCarthy. So this is the trajectory we're on. It's unlikely to yield any more votes than the first ballot did. But this group, this faction, Bob Good says is not going to back down. They're not going anywhere. They expect that they're going to continue to pressure McCarthy as this day goes on. And now they're pushing in the direction of Jim Jordan, who has not unequivocally said he would never serve as House Speaker Ed. Good point. Uh, and you saw him there, though, uh, in a show of, 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 of unity, formally nominate McCarthy in this second term. 
And Scott, you have a very rare view inside the chamber, and we should note to our audience that uh, you are not allowed to use a cell phone or um, be on camera in the chamber because of the rules there. So you are talking to us by phone, but you have been in the chamber all day. Can you kind of give us the fly on the wall perspective that you've been witnessing all morning as these votes have come in? Um, any sort of color about who's been talking? I know you were texting us earlier saying that McCarthy was not giving any indication of how he was feeling. He was just kind of sitting there um, expressionless. Um, what's the mood been like inside that chamber um, as they wait to see who is going to lead them? Never seen anything like this before, perhaps because it's been a full 100 years since a second ballot was needed. McCarthy in his seat is mostly expressionless. Some small smirks, some small, you know, gestures towards people who vote in his favor, not making eye contact, not looking in the direction of those who vote against him. There's a murmur and a stir in the House chamber every time a Republican votes for somebody besides McCarthy. We've noted some of the other Republicans, those not in his camp, moving about the chamber, moving in and out. Some are. Chip Roy of Texas has been planted in his seat by himself since this thing began. So if there's negotiations ongoing with somebody like Chip Roy, it's happening on his phone device. But that's something else, Caitlin. McCarthy's not on his phone. He has to put on reading glasses when he maneuvers his phone, reads it or texts, and he's not doing that. So whatever negotiations he's undertaking are either happening through staff, surrogates, other members, or otherwise. And, Scott, are you getting a sense that it is essentially a stare down at this point? Is there anything else McCarthy could, you know, give them to satisfy uh, what they are asking for? I mean, we've been talking over the past hour about how this group is is not, a, a, you know, a, a united group in terms of, of who they are, where they come from, what exactly they want. Um, is there anything that McCarthy could do to secure these votes, or are we going to see the same thing happen, essentially, on this next ballot? What I think you're going to see, according to the members with whom we just spoke outside the chamber, is some of these other votes, these Republicans who don't support McCarthy, shifting to Jordan. They have seen that already. Congressman Bishop of North Carolina has voted for Jim Jordan. Lauren Boebert, who voted the first time for Jim Jordan, sticks with Jim Jordan. You might see a shift in that sense. But here's the thing. This is not a unified opposition with a singular or unified set of demands or requests. Not clear how. McCarthy can concede or make satisfaction for these members because they don't speak with one voice or they don't have one singular concern. I'm not even sure what fig leaf he could offer them to give them the latitude to change their vote on a second ballot. I think we're in this for at least a second ballot, if not more. And remember, the magic number on the last Never, never Kevin Caucus was 19. We'll see if it grows here as this second round of voting gets underway. Scott McFarland, thank you. We'll let you get back inside the press part of the rafters or the House press gallery up there behind the rostrum where he cannot be on the phone or on camera with us, so he stepped out to do that. Nicole Killian is outside the House chamber in what's called the Will Rogers, by the what's called the Will Rogers statue or the Will Rogers statue hallway there that connects the House chamber to where the uh, Speaker's office eventually is. Nicole, you've been watching this all afternoon as well. We've never been here before. Your thoughts, your, your reporting on what you've seen. Well, you know, I did have a chance to talk to a few members and uh, some folks uh, with uh, McCarthy's team, and I think uh, they continue to uh, insist and kind of stand by this strategy of grinding it out. And, you know, they're not putting any predictions on how many uh, ballots that this will take, uh, but they do feel confident uh, that uh, McCarthy will be standing at the end of the day. Uh, you know, and in talking to McCarthy himself right before he entered the chamber, for that first ballot, uh, you know, he made clear that uh, he isn't backing down and that he's not really going to give in uh, much more to the demands of this minority. He has made clear, as he did in this meeting earlier today in the basement of the Capitol with members, a closed door meeting where uh, he made clear that he has given many concessions already. Uh, so I think uh, to the point that has been raised earlier, it does now become this stare down until 
one side gives. And right now, uh, McCarthy's team and McCarthy himself have indicated that that just simply isn't happening. We do know that he stepped off the floor uh, for a period of time as we were waiting for uh, this second ballot to take place. Unclear uh, what he was doing in that time period, if he was talking to members or trying to negotiate further. Uh, but again, uh, we'll continue be, to be watching uh, not only his actions, but the actions of all of these members as we go into this second round of voting. Nicole Killian for us there outside the House chambers as we watch the second round of voting for Speaker of the House continue in alphabetical order. This is expected to go on for much Castro. of the balance of this hour and possibly the next one. We're only in the seas there at Castro of Texas. That means we got a while to go. Uh, again, McCarthy. Kevin McCarthy failed in the first round to get the 218 Chief votes needed. Formal. We go at it again. It appears those that are opposed to McCarthy for now are coalescing Chief. behind Jim Jordan, the incoming or presumed incoming chairman of the Judiciary Committee as their next alternative. It could be a while. So we'll continue to watch this uh, from here on Capitol Hill with Robert Costa, Scott McFarland, Nicole Killian. I'm Ed O'Keefe. I'm Caitlin Huey Burns, and I know we use the word unprecedented a lot sure in politics, but I think uh, it is worth repeating that we are watching history we are. right now. We're watching it. We've watched it. We're watching it unfold. So please stick with us as we see what happens on this second ballot. It's incredible. Errol and Lana, it's we will toss it back to you. Yeah. yeah, it's been incredible watching and listening to you both. And for all of our viewers, why does any of this matter? No business in the House will be done until a speaker is elected. Nothing else gets done there um, on behalf of the American people until this very issue is sorted out. So we will come back and check in with you, Ed and Caitlin, um, throughout the day. And if you want to jump over and see what's happening there right now, just head to cbsnews.com slash now. We'll be right back. documentary from CBS reports tensions rising between a powerful country and a vital island. The supply of this technology came grinding to a halt. The world would grind to a halt. Absolutely. As Taiwan faces threats and aggression. Taiwan is on the front line and we